All right, I think we're live. You guys uh, look live on your end? Live yeah. Here. There's the tag in the corner. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our uh, weekly podcast, uh, Game Audio Hour, where we discuss all things game audio from creative ideas to the latest techniques, project experiences, and audio secrets. Here's where you find in-depth coverage and opinions related to game audio. And we got a special guest, Frida Wolf. We're Hi. doing all VO. Thanks Hi. for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is going to be an awesome episode. We're really excited. We're looking forward to this I've, for a long time. I've, this is the plan for 007 because it's the James Bond episode, and I figured it should have B.O. Oh, oh. a lot of pressure. Okay. <laughs> anyway, regular panelists are here again this week, and I'm so stoked. Vince, how you doing? Oh, man, I'm doing all right. Looking forward to GDC next week, and then, I don't know, maybe relaxing after that, but, yeah, that's not going to happen. Yo. That's awesome. Mike, how you doing? Doing well. Glad to be back. Also looking forward to GDC, but not to the drive to GDC. <laughs> yeah, well, that's my fault, isn't it? Sorry about that. No, I wasn't. I wasn't pushing guilt. That was in a very general way. Every year, it's a bit of a haul, but. Oh, I love that drive, man. It's five hours of bliss. Jack, how you doing? Not looking forward to the six hours of of bliss that I have flying to GDC. You know, I didn't really need you guys to just rub in the GDC now that I can't go. It's not very polite of you. None of you. You didn't say anything except GDC. <laughs> it's GDC. Everyone does GDC. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah typically, but uh, apparently not me this time. Uh, oh, um, last time. I didn't go last year either. I know. Work schedules. They, they have this lovely little way of, like, screwing me over, right, at GDC time. But this year wasn't that. It's, uh, it's this. I can't go until... Till uh, GDC either doesn't have con cred that it passes around anymore, or I feel better before I go. But anyway, so enough of that. Whack. Frida. Hi. I'm not going to GDC. I'm cool. Yes, we're, we the cool kids are staying home, aren't we? Ooh, I didn't. I didn't plan on it. Like I actually. Uh, so I used to work in games, and I was a sound designer for games, and then I only transitioned to become a full time voice actor last year. Uh, last year's when I finally got an agency. So uh, I feel like I'm still kind of reconfiguring how to relate to game people in the game context because it used to be, you know, if I go to a game con, oh, who are you with? What are you working on? Oh, cool. What are you working on? When's that coming out? Cool. Rad. So now that I'm an actor, it's like, oh, what have I heard you in? Oh, yeah. Oh, I haven't heard of that. Hmm. That's nice. And I've heard uh, a lot from quite a few actors who go to GDC that they have one of two experiences. Either they cling desperately like barnacles to the audio guys because the sound people are nice and they're familiar with VO people and they get the relevance. Or um, the VO actors talk to AAA developers who, you know, if, if you've been with a AAA developer for a long time, you're going to have a little bit of an ego, especially if you haven't had your first layoff or anything like that. So they'll just struggle and be like, oh, that's nice, your talent, bye. And then they'll have uh, a really great time hanging out with the indie developers who can't afford them. Uh, so I had not planned on going, but I've been asked so many times, like tens of times, whether I'm going that I, I guess I should plan on it next year and just figure out how to navigate that. We'll, we'll, uh, you can follow us around, and we will point you to people who have money. <laughs> See, I don't mean... At the end of the day, like, I, I have an agency, and so like I'm on the other end of the sausage factory now, right? And I used to be in the part where um, I was helping casting, and then uh, we, we, being the company, would contract a third-party casting director because it wasn't in-house, and then they would set up the actors. So now I'm one of those actors getting the scripts on the other end. I still audition like everybody else for everything. There's no... there's The concept of, like, going somewhere and being discovered is stupid, although I'm totally about to contradict myself because of Twitter and Octodad, and that's a big deal to me because that's, like, that is setting up a precedent on how business is done now with millennials who have never been through the studio system, and that is huge who have never been through corporate bullshit, they don't have any bureaucracy to go through, they don't have producers who are stopping them from doing whatever they want to do, and then, like, the frickin' news today about FMOD and Unity and on and on and on, the fact that you've got this younger generation that has no emotional trauma from being through a studio system, because before, independent developers made games out of revenge, right? They <laughs> went through the studio system, went in, and they were like, I'll show them! And so that first generation was what, Braid and Bastion and all those guys, right? Um... Everybody in the indie game, the movie, those are all broken human beings that have been completely had their soul stamped out by working for a publisher. But you've got the next generation of kids, 25 and younger, who have never been through that. So 
they're making amazing game mechanics. Nobody's telling them what to make. Like, you got can you do like a Mass Effect meets Halo type of thing, but make it RTS? That'd be great. Marketing isn't leading them. They have tools at their disposal for nominal licensing fees, and they're doing business however the hell they feel like it. So, in the same way that I'm bringing up that I do audition for games like everybody else, and I have to wait for scripts through my agency, and that's fine. I got to do Octodad because I blabbed on Twitter, and out of just out of my butt one day I said, "Man, I'm really excited about this next generation of games." And I I named up. I said between um, Papers Please, Octodad. Um, uh, visceral uh, cleanup detail and another indie game I can't remember I'm really excited about the future not even 5 to 10 minutes later I get an email from Phil Tiptoski who's the lead head of Young Horses which makes Octodad and uh, his email was um, hey uh, we're, we saw you said something nice on Twitter and we're totally creepy and we looked at your website and saw that you're a voice actor and um, would you like to audition like uh, yes, and uh, they award me the part of the daughter and every other female except for the mother, who's played by Anne Sonville, who also does does Tommy the Sun, and that's how I got that gig. So in the same way that I just blathered on about how I'm at the other end of the sausage factory and I go through the same catacol like everyone else, that's the new shit. That's the future um, of everybody who doesn't have, who isn't AAA but has just as every much right and wherewithal to make a game. The end. That's, that's, that's awesome. It's on hey, my mind a lot right now. I was thinking. Oh, sorry about that. Did you? What I missed? What you said there? Sorry. I just said it's it's on my mind a lot right now because it's like, it's it's the beginning. I mean, we're we're definitely in a renaissance where, like, if you look into um Jason Rubin, who's the last leader of THQ and uh, formerly Naughty Dog, if I'm not mistaken, yep. you know, he started off making games in his garage and living or somebody's garage and living out of his car and all that, and like that was the typical starving kid and then pitching and then getting paid and making games. This is the next generation of that. Of, you know, self-made little sweatshops of, of people making games on their own and getting attention and then getting um, sponsorship from, like, Octodad, for example, is the Sony PS4 darling. You go into any Best Buy or Target where there's a PS4 demo, they're playing Octodad on it. Awesome. So well, see, that's that's the perfect reason why you should go to GDC, is you can go up to people and go, Hi, I'm most of the voice talent in Octodad. Yeah. And that that's that's indie cred right there. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm the weirdo where I've had I've without having gone to GDC yet, I've already had very positive experiences um, interacting with indies, even on a completely because that interaction that got me that gig was completely casual. It wasn't, um, you know, bottom barrel scumbag networking of like, hi, do you have money? Because I love a job. It wasn't, it wasn't that at all. It was just like, you're cool, I'm cool. You want to do some cool stuff together? Okay, let's do it. So right. yeah, fine. I'll go to GDC next year. What's up? Yes, heck yeah. Well, hey, before we get too far into it, I wanted to, uh, you know, start with the stereotypical kind of stuff of how you got into the industry and what brought you into voice acting. Okay, so. Um, I decided I wanted to work in video games by the time I was 7, 16, because I was at that point, like, the needle went in right away with, um, Warcraft 2 for Battle.net Edition came out at that point, and Diablo 1, and then EverQuest, um, by the time I graduated high school, and that, that was the beginning of that big stream of trends, right, of, like, online all the time, making friends, this is the best, um, and I previously wanted to be, um, I only did a year and a half of college, and I decided at the time I wanted to be a political campaign manager. And then I was playing games, and then like all my crew of friends were like the typical nerd crew that play role-playing games and introduced me to other games, and we watch Galaxy Quest together and whatever. And I just thought, you know, I thought maybe I could better represent nerds and they can represent themselves because I, sh I shower when necessary, I wash my hair, I can put on makeup and a bra and do that. Um, and so, um, and I've been very fortunate that whenever I've made up my mind, I want this. I'm so direct and aggressive about it that I just get it. So I want it that bad. So um, within six months of making that decision, this will be a long story short. Um, EverQuest had its very first fanfare, which is their like their BlizzCon, their fan convention. Very first one was in Vegas. I was born and raised in Vegas. I was there at the time. Um, they had the sort of fortune of they booked something like. A hundred, a thousand, or twelve hundred registered people, and it was going to be a Friday to Saturday event. And they, the Friday night venue, was the top of Planet Hollywood um, in Caesar's Palace. 
with a 250 person maximum occupancy. And I was like, um, that's cool because there's all these people that have paid so much money for airfare and travel and are coming from out of town and they want to hang out with their guildmates and now they have nothing to do on Friday night. So me being a hometown girl and, you know, hostessing kind of being part of the coal mine industry there, um, I scrambled and I got on the forums like a good little internet nerd and said, hey, everybody, hang out at Gameworks across the street, which I think is no longer there, um, which is an arcade chain. Um, hang out at Gameworks. I'll make it my job to let everybody at this meet and greet dinner thing all 250 of them to wrap up as soon as possible and we'll meet you over there, have a drink in the meantime, have food and you'll meet your guildmates and we'll hang out. And the Sony people noticed and they tracked me down at that first night thing and they said, hey, are you the, the chick from the forums? I said, yeah. And they're like, do you want a job? What? Nice. Uh, so a month later, I moved to San Diego at age 18 and I was a game master for EverQuest, which is for a lot of people, you know, you get in on the bottom floor of a game company that's a bit bigger, where there's room for upward mobility. So, um, and that's typically either what tech support, uh, quality assurance, or customer service. So I got on the customer service way, and uh, I did two and a half years of that. And I, I saw my friends leaving the department, one at a time, kind of finding their groove. People who um, quickly got to do um, design internships, programming internships. People who were artists and started doing that. And I just like. I didn't have the skill set, and I, I went to a performing arts high school. My dad was an actor in the 50s and 60s, and I always had that imposed on me, but at that time, like, I was really focused, because when you're in games, games culture can be so inclusive, and you're, like, riding that high of being around like-minded people um, that I wasn't really able to figure out, well, wh how can I apply my talents, because the, the track seems so clear of, like, if you're not a programmer and you're not an artist, and you're not a designer, you're kind of useless. And if the team's too big, you might bring in a producer, or at Naughty Dog, as they call them, producers, because they're really just people managing the people, the creatives that are out of control. There's there's nothing else for you to do. And so many companies, especially at that time, still were contracting audio at a house that audio just magically appeared over the wall, right? And programmers would um, just plug it in as they saw fit. So audio wasn't something that was even, it wasn't an option. It didn't exist for me. Uh, so, um, the third year in, I was someone's, I was a tech VP's personal assistant, and he very graciously said my review, he's like, I just, you're underused here, and I don't know what to do with you, and I said, me neither. But at that point, EverQuest 2 was in development, and um, EverQuest 2 uh, left a dent in the LABO community. It was the most ambitious, at that time, uh, project VO-wise, it was something like over 100, I want to say 100,000 lines of dialogue, but I could be counting it low. Wow. Uh, they they employed so many actors and had actors do so many different characters that the casting directors and the booth directors were getting in the booth and doing VO. Everyone is a VO <laughs> credit for EverQuest 2, anyone with a SAG card at the time. Um, it was so much VO that they opened up, they they had their first audio department at Sony Online in San Diego, and they opened up a position for someone just to be an implementation monkey and just implement VO, and I was like, <gasps> This segues back to when I was 18, prior to this whole, I want to do games, no, I want to do politics, no, I want to do games thing. Um, for a second, I thought I wanted to be a recording engineer. And this is pre-internet, this is pre-go to the website of the school or Google or go on Twitter and hashtag game audio and ask questions. No, I, uh, I'm i old, so I had the counselor's office at my school and pamphlets um, and very little um, developed internet um resources. So every engineering program I looked for were at proper universities, four-year universities. Most of them that I saw required upper-level credits of math and chemistry. And I was like, I'm never going to be a sound engineer. It's not going to happen because I don't, I don't math or chemistry. No. So I gave up on that. So here I was full circle, three years into video games, and this opportunity showed up. And thankfully they hired me, and that was, that was my gateway. Um, I spent that first year just implementing VO, which, you know, is, is tedious, but I learned a lot because I got to deal with raw files. I even got to do a little bit of editing. I got to use tools like a developer, so that was just like everything at once. The second the game shipped, there wasn't anything for me to do, and I got really, really nervous, and very luckily, um, Mike Smith, who is the sound designer, one of the leads at the time, um, took me under his wing, and, he, and I was like, I, I, I think I want to be a sound designer. And uh, one thing sticks out uh, at the beginning, Heather Sowards, who's also now a freelancer, she was the audio director at the time, she kept telling me, she's like, okay, well, what track do you want? Do you want to do sound design or do you want to focus on VO? And I was like, I don't understand the question. 
<laughs> well, you no, you have to pick one. One, you get one. You do sound design review, and I was like, I don't, I don't get it, because you, she, as the audio director, was overseeing all the assets from, you know, scheduling, coordinating production, um, to dealing with bureaucracy, and she had to deal with all of it. So I didn't understand why I had to choose. And me being really naive and like 21 or whatever, I was like, I can do everything. So I, I focused on sound design. But, and, and, and Mike was um, kind enough where he would just throw everything at me, like, make a door, make a footstep, do it again, do it better, do it better. And he was just, um, everyone I know who's, uh, who's successful in, in this business has a mentor, somebody who was gracious enough to just give them the time of day, and Mike was that for me, and you know, I'm eternally grateful for that. Um, and being a sound designer, as it happens very often in companies, gave me access to, just out of necessity, to go to VO recordings um, and supervise and direct. So I got to be a booth director. And then on top of all that, because I'm just kind of naturally raw with the ability to do VO, I'd get thrown in the booth constantly in the studio whenever they needed temp VO because I was a warm body. I was cheap in house free labor. And oftentimes I also get shipped too, <laughs> um, just as, as VO because I was capable. So that was that became my training for years. And so that was eight years of my of my experience in games was doing sound and being having VO kind of front and center. Um, so when I actually got into VO, what happened was uh, in 2009 was a pretty dramatic year for me. Um, my grandmother in Mexico City dies. I was laid off from Obsidian in August, and my mother died on Christmas Eve. Oh. And I'm an only child, so I had to clean up all that mess um, and deal with all that legal stuff between here, Las Vegas, and Mexico City. So it was my first time forcibly being um, a freelance sound designer. I couldn't possibly work in-house anywhere. There's no way. Um, so at that, that's when I did some work for Behemoth and um, some other little indie groups. And a girlfriend of mine from the goth scene when I was a little club kid in San Diego, she works for Costco Auto, and she uh, called me. She's like, hey, you do, sound, you do voices, right? And I was like, yeah. She's like, oh, we need someone to be the, the voiceover for the phone system. And um, a flash feed on the website. You want to do? Oh, it's for money. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, uh huh? Yeah, yeah. So I did it, and I got paid for it. And I was like, oh shit, people want to pay me for this. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, so, and it felt good, and it was fun. And like with most things, where you know it feels good and it's fun, you want to do it more. So I'm very, I'm one of those people where I've never had the ego to do something because. I have talent, and you will love me. I've, this is not me. I'm very... Um, I have total imposter syndrome. I'm very self-conscious. I'm very insecure. I'm always voraciously trying to absorb other humans and their essence and what they have to offer. So I immediately started going to Burbank and Los Angeles just taking classes. Um, took classes all over town. I, took, I started with commercials at VoiceCaster and Burbank. I spent a lot of time with Richard Horvitz, who was the voice of Invader Zim, who was an Excellent, life-changing, brain-exploding teacher. Um, so he's absolutely my, my voiceover mentor. And um, then I got a permanent job at Turtle Rock, which is now making Evolve. Um, and I only lasted there a year and a half, and it, it was good. It was an extremely negative experience because it was an unfixable, unresolvable, unresolvable personality conflict between me and two of the people I was supposed to work with most intimately, and I didn't want it to get better. It was so emotionally distressing that I just sort of curled up and died. Oh. And I waited for it to get so bad that they fired me, and the two um, owners still, I mean, they, they love me. They still keep tabs on me. They're like dads. They keep tabs on me on Facebook and Twitter to see how I'm doing. They really care. They helped me carry my stuff to the car. It was an extremely amicable breakup, but it was the punch in the throat that I needed. Because changing, I mean, I'm, I'm 31, I'll be 32 this year. Changing careers dramatically after spending the first 12 years of your adult life in a very specific thing is terrifying. And I had a lot of reservations about, like, I, I have to keep, I mean, that's why I went back to a, a full-time job in sound design. I'm like, I, this is what I do, this is what I know. I can't entertain anything else because I haven't done anything else, and I, I don't know if I can make income or anything. Oh, my God, I can't do it, I can't do it. Um, but it was it was such a wonderfully terrible experience that it it really propelled me into like, fuck it, I'm gonna do it. And I've been and for four years straight. Those four years between the time um, of 2009 and 2012, so three years, I never stopped going to LA for classes because it was just so fun. I've gone through UCB improv and all that, and I just I didn't want to stop. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna do it. 
So I went to Richard Horvitz, my mentor, and um, had him produce my animation and commercial demos. And um, <clears throat> and that was in... Sorry, I'm getting over a sinus infection, so this is not my sexiest voice, but it's my... No problem. Um, I had him do my, my demos in January, and he got them back to me done in March, and I immediately... I Again, I, I know how to internet, and I love it and abuse it, and that's why I get jobs through Twitter and whatever. Um, I went through voicebank.net, and I went on the back end, and I listed every single agency in the Los Angeles area, and then some, and I just cold called email. I must have sent out like 120 emails. Um, no name dropping of whom I worked with or whatever, just saying these are my stats, that I speak uh, Spanish fluently, here's my website, here's my demos in this email, here's my demos in this, in this uh, web address. Um, I got back from this, like 120, I got 10 responses, which is actually a lot especially for someone who's green and out of nowhere and no one's ever heard of. Um, and ultimately, I went with um, Atlas, which I signed my paperwork to start working with them the same day Richard Horvitz, my mentor, was signing his paperwork to work with them, which is not normal. Hmm. Bye, Kyle. Bye, Kyle. <clears throat> which Kyle. Is insane. Um, but it was really, that was really dramatic. That, I, that was my validation of, like, I'm getting signed to an agency the same day as my mentor. That's not right. Um, and I, I haven't stopped booking since I started. The end. Huh. So it's, Sorry it's, about a, that. it's a long, I apologize, it's, it's a long-winded path and stuff, but I kind of, I have to go through all the motions because I'm one of those weirdos where, like, I've, sometimes I feel really weird around other actors, and I've, I've talked about it as, um, I feel like I transferred high schools in the middle of freshman year or something. Like, I've been in the game audio high school, right, and I just transferred school to VO. And immediately, once I showed up in VO, I already know, I know who the cool, like, it's like walking in the lunchroom. I know who the cool kids are. I know who the jocks are. I know who the nerds are. Um, <clears throat> and everyone's been really gracious to me. I've already sat and had lunch with, like, the cool kids once or, once or twice. They're like, oh, it's a new kid. We should show you around. And that sort of thing. So I still feel like I'm getting used to my new school, but the schools are very close to each other. Awesome, so awesome. I feel, yeah, I always sorry feel about, like I go through all about, that. Sorry about stepping out for a minute. My daughter, I thought she was alone yogurt. in the other room, and I had to check on her really quickly because I heard something fall. Oh, God. But no, mom's got her. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Well, that that is super interesting. Man, that's quite a long path. Would you recommend yeah. for other people who are interested in VO to go through an audio path like sound design? So... Since showing up, again, at my new high school, um, I've met two kinds of kids' backgrounds. Some people are um, actor actor actors, like they were child actors, and they've been through theater and musical theater, and they just fell into VO, and they really liked how it makes money, and you don't have to be on set at 5 in the morning, and that it's more stable, and blah, blah, blah. And then there's weirdos like me who come out of left field from different disciplines, but sometimes related disciplines where we get it, like Eric Bauza is huge. Oh my God! Uh, look at his IMDb credits. Rapshing miles, mile long. Um, incredible range. He was a character layout at, at, um, character layout artist for animation. Um, and I, 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 he was nice enough to talk to me on Twitter a couple weeks ago. Um, and there is something about if you come from the production side, it's an easier transition because you already know you've been the client. You know what's expected of you. You know what you're expected to produce in a four-hour session. Um, him coming from animation, he knows what animators want. Me coming from video games, I know what, what the game client wants. I know how to do attacks and damages. You don't have to teach me. It's the other stuff that's harder. So likewise, Eric told me he has a hard time booking commercials. I haven't booked animation because I didn't come from that end, and so I'm still learning that culture, if that makes sense. Gotcha, yeah, so, it does. Um, there's nothing wrong... There's nothing wrong with being a weirdo like me and coming out of left field and doing it, in, you know, in middle age. I, I always feel like that's why I continue training and stuff because I feel like I have to do a lot of catch up with the kids who were child actors and all that stuff. Are you able on contracts to uh, land quite a few voices or do you always end up find it, kind of getting typecast into something? Okay, that is really interesting. Um, I have learned the secret of typecasting. Typecasting is a compliment. When you're typecast over and over, it means that people like that thing you do enough to pay you money for it all the time, more than the other things you do, and it's not an insult, and it's, I think it's important for actors to embrace that. In the same way, like, um, game audio musicians, like, if, if you're um, Sasha Dickensian, who does amazing freaking techno house stuff, like, he's very synthy, 
I don't think he gets insulted for being hired to do that kind of thing over and over again because everyone else knows that's what he, he's good at. He knows that's what he's good at, and that's what puts Britt on the table, right? Um, so for me, I have been typecast for one thing. I've done a lot of little kid um, educational stuff and, like, a lot of little girl and a lot of little boy stuff, but I have the most fun just being that's the loud part of me. Um, and I get a lot of commercial work, which surprises me. But I, I have a theory as to why. Um, commercial work is this very, very carefully created Fabergé egg that was presented to you by a team of creatives, both the client and an agency service that has spent all this time very carefully putting this Fabergé egg together. And they're, they're handing it to you with very specific instructions on how to treat it. And that's fine. Um, when it comes to animation, when you do an animation audition or a job, it's like you're a premier private chef and you've been invited to someone's house, and they're like, dazzle me. <laughs> and you're like, um, do you have any allergies? Do you have any preferences? I don't care. Dazzle me. That's literally what's like in animation. You're expected to whip something out, that your, your best dish that you're so proud of, that you know is delicious, that either they're going to love it or hate it, but you have to have the confidence and bring it. You don't get to ask, do you want salami? They don't know. You have to show it. And maybe you show them salami, and they put in their mouth, and they hate it, and you don't get the job. So um, <clears throat> that's something I personally have to overcome with animation still of just having the confidence to just bring it and you know what? This is my salami. I'm sorry if you don't like it. Maybe the next audition will like it. Ugh. That's awesome. So you, so unfortunately I have to deal with a lot of rejection, huh? Um, yeah, I have an actor friend who told me that a what's considered a healthy ratio is for every 10 auditions you do if you can book one for every 10. Oh, wow. That's good to know. Ish. It. Um, I don't know what my ratio is. I have not gone a week without booking in a long time. Knock on all the wood. This is not wood, but it'll have to do. Um, <clears throat> uh, and there's a theory on that, too. So, you know, typically um, people fall into long-standing relationships when they're just completely, they don't care about having anyone in their lives um, versus the guy who's just so desperate to be like, please, please love me, love me, please. What, what can I do to make you happy? That guy dies alone. Um, in the same way, if you become a desperate voice actor and every audition has in the back of my like, I really need this job, everybody quotes chorus line of like, I, I desperately need this job or I'm not going to eat. It comes out your mouth, it's recorded by the microphone, and it goes into your take and everyone can smell it. Even if they can't identify it, they smell the desperation. Yeah. So I've chosen <clears throat> to stop being desperate and just not worry about it, and it really, it really does work. People want to date me. They keep giving me money to do this. It's amazing. That's awesome. Hey, guys, you got some questions? Oh, by the way, Octodad's in the chat room. Is that the, who's that? Octodad? Octodad. I wonder if it's Tom Taylorson, who's the voice of Octodad. Uh-oh. We'll find out. Oh, it's Jeff Seamster. Jeff Seamster <laughs> was um, <clears throat> a sound designer at the now RIP defunct Irrational Games, and he's one of my heroes because he worked on Bioshock Infinite, and I hope he and all of his Irrational buddies get jobs super, super quick. Oh, man, the nature of this business is killing. So, guys, uh, questions. What do you got? Freedom, wow. what is your background in voiceover implementation bring to your experience as a voiceover artist? What can you draw from your prior life uh, into what you're doing now? Um, I understand the importance of variety, that's for sure. I mean, that's, that's something that most actors already know going in about. They're expected every take needs to be different, especially if they're directed that way. Um, but as a sound designer, I'd get, I still get really pissed off if I'm playing a game, and so obviously the sound designer did not play that, that game and they didn't try the sound out or whatever, if it's something really repetitive that gets triggered a lot, you should know better as a sound designer instead of like putting all this flourish and all this pizzazz and this giant distorted sound that goes off every three seconds. It's your job to, to go in and see how um, a sound is being used. So in that context, when I'm in the booth, I'm very um, inquisitive about how what I'm doing is being used and in what context and how repetitive can I or can I not be because I don't want them to go home with audio that they can't that they can't use because that's a waste of everyone's time and money. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. It's an issue all the way around, isn't it? I mean, constantly hearing things that are too repetitive and we've talked a lot about how trying to find ways to kill repetitive audio. Mm -hmm. uh, any other question, guys? So so do you prefer game audio to commercials, or do you prefer commercials to game audio? 
Um, games are always going to be my home. That's my happy place, and that's where I came from, and that's my first high school. So <laughs> I've been really, um, I'm freaking over the moon that I've been able to trick the people that I'm auditioning for into hiring me into video games. And, like, keep in mind, like, I know a lot of people in games because that's my home, but um, nobody that's cast me has heard of me before. So I'm getting in on merit, which is amazing. That feels really, really good. Um, so whenever I book um, a game, I feel like I'm home and I'm doing something that I really believe in and is really especially important to me. Commercials, um, some people might be dismissive of them, of them, but they're actually really, really fun, uh, especially... I've had a few commercials where their partner reads. I've had I've booked with two or three people, and it's meant to be, especially for radio, it's meant to be like a bantery dialogue, and it's genuinely fun. And it doesn't. I don't feel stupid. Like I did, I did a commercial for a Dunkin' Donuts Dunkin' Donuts cheesecake donut. Did you get yeah. a lifetime supply of their coffee? Yeah, no, they, <laughs> they have so many donuts now. Um, no, and I had a lot of fun with another gal just going off about the indulgence of this cheesecake donut, and we had a blast, and, and, and I got paid to stand an hour in a box talking about donuts. I mean, awesome. <laughs> it's such a stupid job, and I love it. What about, like, uh, reading books or anything like that? Does do you, do you look into all the different areas where you can get some voiceover work? Is there anything that you don't feel comfortable doing? You are talking about animation. Um, you know what? I, there is a website called acx.com, I believe. ACX is part of audible.com, which is owned by amazon.com. ACX is where any actor um, can sign themselves up, create a profile page, and um, connect directly with authors to audition and to do books and stuff. And I was on there for a minute, and I had a very embarrassing incident where this is right before my agency got involved and all that stuff. Um, I got booked through a guy who was very intent on having me do his book. I live in Irvine. I'm married to a guy who works at Blizzard, so I'm trapped behind the Orange County in, in Irvine, but all the work's in L.A. 90% um, of the time when I book through my agency, it's in Los Angeles, and that's a good... I have to set aside at least two and a half hours to get there on time, with time to pee. Um, so if I book, you know, and add in the round trip, that's a good five to six hours in the car. That's at least... That's more than half my day. Um, so I, I'm, I very unfortunately had to get out of that contract and I just closed down my profile because I was like, I ain't got no time to do audiobooks. I do know some people who actively work through agencies and do book audiobooks, but that's, it's a lot of time. And also, um, something that I, I don't miss as much, and, and this is going to sound horrible, the beauty of being a voice actor is that that is your only function. It is your function to show up and be a lip flap and make sounds. I ain't responsible for the mastering. I'm not responsible for the editing. I'm not responsible for cleaning up my takes. I happily do it when I'm recording from home, but um, that goes into my fee, right, because it's more time. Yeah. Um, but when I just go to L.A., my job is to show up and play and have fun, and it's the poor engineer's problem to, you know, clean up all my, my mouth spits and whatever. Um, <laughs> so that's a nice luxury. Guys, you got some more? Oh, man. Um... What do you think about uh, some of the good things and bad things that you've seen booth directors do? Like, do you have recommendations for people who find themselves on the other side of the glass directing you? Um, yeah, the, when some of the best experiences I've had is actually with Octodad, which kudos to them, Seth Parker, who's an adorable young man who's barely starting his career. Um, and they had, it was him and the writer present over Skype uh, directing me in here in my room. Nice. Um, they they liked my uh, my audition enough to trust me to give me room to play without trying to overly control me outside of situations where either I had to ask, like, what's going on in this scene, or they caught me and they're like, ah, that's the wrong sentiment because that's not going on. But they gave me so much breathing room, and, and every actor will tell you that, well, there's two kinds, to be fair. There's always two kinds of everything, right? Um, if you have enough confidence in the character and you've you've assimilated it enough, that will carry you to make very secure choices in every take you give because you've already, like, I've made I've made up my mind about the world and the character and how I'm feeling, what I'm doing. I'm just going to run rampant like a stallion, and unless you say stop, I'm not going to. Um, and that's wonderful. It gets really weird and inhibiting when, um, when you start over micromanaging an actor and it's like, mm, that's not what I want. The, the last man's most desperate thing, and everyone will tell you this, is line reads. When it gets to the point where you have to give a line read to an actor and the actor at that point has to surrender and just, like, do what you do, um, you'll get the sound you want of, like, um, say, like, 
Like, I'm asked to do, I'm going to the store. And they're like, no, say it, I'm going to the store. Well, I'm musically, I'm going to imitate what I just heard. But unfortunately, at that at that cost, you might sacrifice the, the feeling, the emotion, the intent, like all, all the actual performance stuff in exchange for just hitting your musical notes and your musical preference. And some booth directors don't care because that might be all they're going for. And at the end of the day, they're the ones who are, the client's present, that's what the client wants, and the client's paying, that's what they get. And it's and sometimes it's easier to just give up and, and do that, but nobody likes a line read. And it also makes the actor feel like, oh, I'm not giving you what you want, I'm incompetent, I'm a piece of shit, I shouldn't even be acting, you know what, today I quit. I'm not even, I'm going to go home, I'm going to be a fridge salesman, whatever. It, they can make you feel that way if it spirals that bad. You touched upon an interesting subject, which is uh, researching your character and getting inside the head of the person whose voice you are embodying. How much opportunity do you have with uh, game projects to research what's going on in the game world and the characters in particular? Um, I'm pretty obsessive because I love, I love Google. So every time I get an audition for anything, um, usually I can, I can either Google the name or the character and immediately figure out what larger product, if it's in um, production, it's a part of, and then just like read the wiki on that character. There's a lot of, thankfully there's a lot of documentation on set licenses, like if it's anything from DC or Marvel or um, even stuff like World of Warcraft or whatever, there will be wikis about it so you can you can really care. The problem with that is that you have to be careful because it can over inform your performance um, and it can rob you of something maybe raw and fresh that maybe kind of, you know, sideswipes the the client and they're like, oh, we weren't expecting that. It is it is common, not common, exceptional, but sometimes it works really well, where a client or creative will change the specs around the audition because they like what you did so much and it's so weird and off the wall and they're like, you know, what, you, you wrote the character better than we did. So I, I personally do, I care about the universe, but I also try not to let it over inform me. That's a really delicate balance. Because you can end up... Because if everybody overinforms themselves, they'll all everyone's going to submit the exact same read, and that's boring. And that's and that's when the people who make weird choices do get booked. I got so many questions. I'll go with another one. So, how do you keep your voice in shape? Uh, not by having a sinus infection. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> um, there's a lot of there's a lot of mm, tricky trick stuff like. And this is throat coat tea. That's an actual. That's the name of the product. There's throat coat tea. There's um, honey loquat, which is um, a Chinese fruit, and it comes. It looks like black tar, and you put it in your tea, or you. It's like little kids' cough medicine that tastes really great. There's also just shutting up, and vocal rest. Um, and that's happened a lot. Where if I do, um, well, it's hard because when you're you have an agency, I I always describe it as like I'm on a hamster wheel. Um, my agency is great most every day. Like, as soon as I get out of here, I'm going to have to do auditions that are due tomorrow. Um, and you will have auditions in your inbox if you worked four hours that day and screamed your head off and were killed 50 times. And you're still expected to do those auditions, and you can't give one iota a weakness to your agency because they might stop sending you as much stuff because they figure you can't handle the volume. Um, I'm sure the voice actors that work every single day have a hard time with that and they you know I've heard them talk about like oh yeah I'll be up at one in the morning doing it but I'm um, personally I have a very delicate immune system this is or this is my fault um, if I don't go to bed on time and I'm up too late and I'm stressed I get a sinus infection because my immune system is at an all-time low so I'm actually this is the week I'm gonna become an adult I'm, I'm saying it live on the internet I'm gonna go to bed early like a like <laughs> an old person, and be consistent about because because you can't work when you're sick are there any uh, are there any tricks? My wife is a singer, and when she uh, is hitting some like mega notes, I always think, why isn't your voice dead after that? And she sh she tells me it's all about the breathing and the delivery. There's like they learned in opera school some special way of of how to deliver these notes. Like rock singers will deliver these mega sounds, and you think that they're just like ripping their throat apart, but it's because they learned how to do it and make it sound like they're ripping their throat apart. They haven't. Do you have something like that that you do? Yeah, it's it's all muscle memory. You remember what what hurt you and what didn't, um, and you find um, sometimes you learn in front of people and they watch you go through it. But you find different places in your throat and in your placement. Um, like Fred Tattershore and Dee Bradley Baker, who do a lot of creature stuff, do it a lot, and they have they have to find ways where it can sit in their throat. 
So like you guys know, um, vocal cords are like actual little flaps that vibrate, right? When you use it enough, you can start to tell where it's going, and also by like the sound you're producing, if it's sitting in a healthy place or not in a healthy place. There's also like smart stuff, like if you're an athlete, you're gonna warm up before you go for a run, and you're gonna cool down afterwards. Um, some people do singing, some people do exercises in the car. I I definitely do a lot of singing in the, in the car with the radio on the way up to a job and on the way back. Um, but you have basically don't ever forget that your your vocal cords are all it's all musculature like anything else, and it has a limit. And so just treat it in the same way you would a runner and your legs and the rest of it. Yeah, good good points. Don't ever forget that it's it's definitely finite. <laughs> I just don't sing because it's horribly sound. It sounds terrible. That's how I save my voice. That's perfect. That's a joke, by the way. Anybody can laugh. Help yourself. No, I'm not going to do that. Whatever. Eh. I quit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's next? Uh, um, well, let's see. Um, what do you think about uh, ensemble stuff? It seems like uh, I've been to a couple of different talks in the last few years, and you know, there's always these guys that say, "Yeah, you know, you got to do an ensemble. It's, it's always great to do things ensemble." Um, of course, that's not the same. Every time I've done a, a, a voice session, it's always just been one person in the booth doing their side of the script. Um, uh, have you done Have you done both sides? Uh, what do you think? Um, so from the client side, it's an issue of cost and schedules. Um, it can get it gets very expensive. I think I I could be wrong, but I believe like on the SAG AFTRA on the union side, it does actually scale up for cost. And also, just getting the schedules to match of two very busy people can be impossible. But it's so worth it when you can do it. Um, I've done ensemble, not games yet, um, but I've done ensemble read commercials, and it's night and day. Um, because you, like, I was just having this conversation with my husband um, a night or two ago. And it's really, so we watch back-to-back, -back, two things back-to-back. -back. There's two great documentaries, well, one. I Know That Voice, which is made by John DiMaggio, and it's a very comprehensive um, behind-the-scenes inter interviews and history of voiceover, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then uh, on the TV, they were showing, it was basically a show reel, 35 years of ILM magic, and I recorded it. And we watched those two, two nights back-to-back. -back. And, I mean, him being a 3D model or me being a voice actor, there's a lot of, like, art-fart process talk in my house. And so we talked about it, and um, on the ILM thing, they were talking about, Robin Williams was making fun of Liam Neeson um, whining about working on Star Wars and how he just felt so alone and so, just so in, in, incompetent and, and, and like a terrible actor and like questioning whether he should continue acting because of all the green screen, green screen stuff he had to do and like, you know, talking to an invisible Yoda and the rest of it. Um, and there have been plenty of things in the press. Um, Ian McKellen broke down and cried on set. They had to stop filming because um, because of the forced perspective for The Hobbit. He couldn't be in the room at the same time as the uh, as the dwarfs and and Bilbo. That's all added in later. So he's act he's trying to be jovial with a bunch of people who aren't there. Um, and then also Hugo Weaving made a statement that pissed off Michael Bay about how he did the voice of Optimus Prime, and he was like, I hated it, it's a dumb job, I just showed up for the money, whatever, voiceover, stupid. What happens is the actory actors that come from that background, act, acting is reacting, right? So um, it's all about you having a very honest reaction to the environment and, and the people that you're interacting with the same way I'm interacting with you guys. This is on it. I'm not acting. I didn't prepare for this. That's what acting should be like. It, it shouldn't require any preparation whatsoever, really. Um, you do voiceover, that all goes away. You're in isolation. And if I was voice acting this Google Hangout, um, I would have to make up all of you and keep all of you in my mind and all of your individual personalities and how I feel about you um, in this room and whether I'm comfortable in this room. I'd have to fake my sinus infection, whatever. Um, I'd have to make all that up. And that, that it, it's so emotionally soul-sucking. Voiceover makes everybody really emotionally exhausted and really, really sweaty, because you're doing the work of all your scene partners who aren't there, really. Um, and it and it's hard, and it's, it sounds silly to whine about, but when you've got people like Ian McKellen breaking down in tears, that's how much it affects you as a person. You you do you have to get past the point where you don't feel like a crazy person in solitary, 
making up this whole world and all the people in it so you can give a good performance. So the ensemble is worth it because it relieves some of that that all-consuming brain pressure to make everything surreal. I mean, that's why you've got, why we're moving towards performance capture like The Last of Us. That was all real. That was real to them. They did it on a set. Everyone was there in person. Um, it was as real as it could be, you know, in, in the stupid onesies with the balls on them. But they had people to play with. So that helped the performance, and that's why that's won a billion awards. It's so much harder to replicate that in a box by yourself. So if you have the money and you have the time, Ensemble is absolutely worth it. It's just not otherwise. It voiceover is kind of like a drive through You know, you schedule your actor, they come in, they do the four-hour session, and they leave, and it's like, next, next, and that's fine. But when you cobble it all together, it's, n it's not going to feel necessarily as great and as organic as having people in the room. And that's always going to be the argument, but... It's like finding the system. There's nothing you can do about it. So it, it forces people to be better actors. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Well, we got, uh, uh, I guess, 13 minutes left. So um, uh, usually we, we take that at the end of the show, we start talking about, like, just stuff that's on our mind. And with GDC coming up, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to uh, to talk about what our plans are and any kind of, like, advice for traversing GDC from all the different perspectives, like... Uh, being a voiceover actor, do you follow the audio track? You had said a little bit about that at the beginning. And what do you guys have for recommendations for GDC? Such a stark contrast from one to the other, but I want to mix the VO with the GDC. Well, my, my, my advice that I give to anyone who would really, really want advice from us, whoever that might be, would be oh. take business... <laughs> the two of them would be uh, take business cards. You would be surprised how many people do not take business cards to a networking event. It yeah. is ri ridiculous. I think I bought like 500 business cards through Moo. So, yeah, and and if, I, if I do GDC right, I will come home with none. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, business cards, uh, talk to people, wear deodorant. Yeah. Um, uh, don't personal space people. <laughs> uh, go to the talks if you can. I mean, uh, I think. Are they worth it? I want to hear that. I want that. Have you ever seen a VO talk, or that, is that happening? Are you an uh, there, past guy? There are some uh, VO talks going. Um, actually, um, Mike Surix is doing a VO talk with um, Steve Gaynor of Gone Home, David Chan of The Long Dark, Chip Beeman of Formosa, and Jennifer Hale, who everyone should know. Um, Not Free the Wolf? Should add Free to Wolf. Huh? <laughs> Those are all excellent people. I work with Chip, and he's he's wonderful. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. So, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, there's uh, there's video talks going on. That's definitely worth going to. And and Mike, you know, he, he has done a bunch of stuff. He He's famous for Bioshock 2. Um, uh, uh, I think I think the talks are definitely worth it. I mean, you, I learned a bunch the last two years I went. But last year I went. I, the first year I went was two years ago, and I just did the the expo pass, which means I could hang out in the hallways and and creep on people. And then last year I had a press pass, uh, much like this year, so I was able to go into all the talks and talk to people. And you you it's you do learn a lot, and you you see some some cool stuff going on. And yeah, I definitely recommend like the audio pass, even though uh, I've gone on the expo pass before, and 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 I've been, I did well that year on the expo pass. But when I uh, when I do the audio pass, what's really cool about it, and I recommend, is that, um, you know, if you're trying to network with somebody, you got to spend more time with them. And if they're going to a talk, and you're going to a talk, you've got an opportunity to walk to the talk. But uh, those with expo passes don't have that opportunity. And so I, I mean, definitely it, recommend uh, getting audio passes. If nothing else, it gives you longer time to network. I mean, if you if you absolutely ha cannot afford more than three hundred dollars, still get an expo pass. But yeah. Yeah. if you can justify the cost, which you can write off on taxes, uh, make sure to to get to the audio pass um, or even a higher pass, and you know go and see other talks. Uh, we're, we're we're not in a bubble. You can you can see coding talks and modeling talks and game design talks. Those people are the people that can, might be able to get you jobs as well. At least you know in an indie space. I have yeah. a suggestion. Yeah, hit us. Um, my husband and I one year went to Austin GDC, and what I mean by that is we flew to Austin when GDC was happening, and we hung out on Fifth and Sixth Street at night at the bars where everyone was. 
And Matt, like that night, I met um, a couple of VO actors. Um, this is what five years ago. Who to this day still send me casting stuff. Like it, sometimes, if you if you have no interest or no financial ability to go to the actual show, just be there. Be in the general area, and there's always fallout into the local bars and the restaurants and stuff. And you know, stay sober enough, be coherent, and be memorable, and not be remembered for the bad stuff, and make relationships that way. Because um, I, I find that honestly just as effective. Because when you're going to the talks and stuff, you're also it's kind of like being in church. You know, you're all on your best behavior and you're twiddling thumbs and you're listening, but you're not actually interacting with the people there. So go to places afterwards where it, social engagement is the point, and that that yeah. helps. That's almost yeah. just as good, honestly. I yeah. was GDC happens after GDC, but I didn't want to uh, detract from the importance of at least uh, getting some more time with people inside the doors. But definitely, I mean, every contract that I've ever gotten through GDC, and I've done rather well, has been at a bar, the W or the Chieftain or something after all the stuff happened. Yeah, that, that's my suggestion as well. It's like if you can't even afford the $300 for an Expo Pass, it, but you can still make it out there somehow, just go to the parties. Uh, Hang around the W's. Get into the gang party after the gang awards. Yeah, uh, getting into the parties is a big deal too. I mean, that's that's rather tough though to do. I I find myself during the what's it uh, during the expo floor they'll they'll serve beer for a while, and uh, yeah, that, that, that fills up so fast. So get there early, get ready for that, and uh, and check out the demos, man, of all the games. I mean, I, all the parties I've gotten into, like Microsoft or CCP Games or whatever, where it turned into work, was because I actually went to their booth checked out what they were doing. I noticed a lot of people will go around and try to finagle a deal or, hey, if you're going that way, can you get two tickets? If, you know, No, go there, spend your time to learn what they're doing and, uh, and spend some time learning what they're doing. Don't just gloss it over. you got to really spend some time on the expo floor and invest your, your time talking to these people about the projects they're working on. And then you might get an invitation to the party. And then that's great because the party really is where you're going to get some close contact with some people who, uh, who can actually... Uh, talk to you about the work that they need. I think uh, I actually met Vincent uh, walking to the GDC party last year. I think yeah, I was Rob walking to Pyramind. Yeah, we were walking to Pyramind, and I, I, I was talking very loudly behind him. <laughs> Whatever works. Whatever so, works. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where the mag magic happens. Do you guys have any uh, memorable, uh, most memorable experiences at GDC? I have a couple. Uh, I remember uh, the escalation this, of the uh, IGDA parties, how each one was, for a couple of years, bigger and louder than the last one. And, uh, Kyle, we were talking about this the other day, where they just packed a ballroom of a hotel, and just the sheer decibel count was just higher than I'd ever encountered, including standing, you know, in rocks throwing distance of an airplane engine. That was just so deafening. And uh, it got amusingly out of control. It was kind of like how E3 would just get bigger and more intense every year, and the, the IGDA parties were, were very similar. I think they may have hit the ceiling on intensity, and maybe they're pulling back a little bit now. Yeah, you were saying we were at that party together. I remember the tables. That's the only way I knew that we were at the party together. But uh, that thing packs. Yeah. There's so many people in there. So uh, one of my memorable experiences was I uh, was with a group of guys who were doing a talk and uh, it, it was pretty funny. I'm a big fan of Tim Schafer. Who isn't? And, uh, and I was in the lounge with the people who were doing the talk, and there was one chair that was free, so I ran over and I grabbed it and I brought it to the table where I was sitting with uh, my friends who were doing a talk. <laughs> and this guy just like starts knit, just, just hitting me on my shoulder, and I turn around to Tim Schafer, and he's like, you stole my freaking chair. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Whoa. I was like, take that, mister. So I uh, hear have a chair, and then I stood there like a dweeb. But hey, it's Tim Schafer. That was one of my favorite ones. You guys got any other ones? Wow. Or Frida, uh, you got any favorite memories of GDC? Uh, well, I've I I was paid to go um GDC San Francisco one year. Like I mentioned, I went to Austin GDC for fun in the this experimental like let's let's go, and it was just as um as effective. I would say like that Austin GDC experience was awesome because I I. Without trying, like I find, ugh, I've had success um, in all these things that I've chosen to do because I choose to be a human being about it and not uh, kind of like a slimy networking business person about it. And I, I can't say that enough. And I don't know if that's like a teachable thing, but if if people can just learn to relax and just be human beings about like, hey, you're cool. What do you do? Cool. And just 
don't go fishing for what can this person do for me because people smell that and it's gross. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Be, be a person. And at the end of the day, everyone likes to hire their friends who they work with. And it's not because of any sort of favoritism or nepotism. It's because not only can I depend on a, on a good product from you, but you're not going to be a dick. Right? Yeah. So right. just be a decent human. Um, so GDC San Francisco, the one time I was paid to go, it was really cool. Um, I went to some audio track stuff, uh, Trolls Froman. If I'm saying that right, he was at uh, Crystal Dynamics for a long time. Um, he did this a really amazing talk. I don't know if he does it regularly, but he it was just one of those things where he was um, reminding sound designers and composers about you can make music and not just become reliant and lazy on patches and synths and that sort of thing. Because also, you know, that sounds canon like everything else. And he demoed this really beautiful song that featured a, a, a bass hit from his toilet and I'll never forget it. <laughs> but he did that to just to prove a point of like, you know, you don't. It doesn't matter the source. If it sounds good, it sounds good, and you should use it, and you should push yourself to be as creative as possible. Like um, a while ago, was it Warhammer when Warhammer was in production? I think like they recorded drums in a in an underground parking garage just to get that reverb in. So um, yeah, I enjoyed those conversations and those talks a lot. Actually, like that one GDC. Yeah, I have a, totally have a story. Now, one GDC I went to San Francisco, I go to the Trolls uh, Froman thing, I come out and I sit down, and frickin' Damien Kaspauer, who everyone knows, is like, you, I don't know you, I'm gonna know you. And he pulls me in with his magnet, like he does to everybody. And next thing you know, I'm sitting in this giant circle of audio people I have never known, and now do know, um, because that's what Damien does. Because, perfect example, he's a great human being, who cares about human beings and doesn't care if you can do something for him or if you can get a job for him or whatever. He cares about the human first. So as a result, everyone knows who Damien is and he's like the flagship leader for Hashtag Game Audio and he's always asking questions and mentoring people who want it without being any sort of elitist about it. Like That's the kind of person I think everyone should strive to be. Not, not to make him a total hero, but he's a total hero. He's an absolute total hero. I've never met him. I need to meet him. Well, you need to go to GDC. Yeah. Yeah, bad on me. And kind of on that point, but, you know, over at GDC, there are all these guys that are into making games, and some of them are more gregarious, but there are a whole lot of guys that are actually really anxious and really introverted, and some of them actually, they're, of course they don't say it, but they really wouldn't mind someone saying hi to them. You know? Yeah. And, you know, I think... If you are introverted and you're wondering what to do at GDC, you know, try to say hi to a couple of guys, and maybe it will turn into a conversation. That's the first thing. I saw a guy who wore a chain around his 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 neck and had a piece of paper that just said hi. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I said hi, you know, and then you stop and you talk to a guy like that. I was getting food and I was like, hey, what are you doing? I I don't. It is the terrible part. I don't remember if he was in the game industry or anything. I don't even know if we talked about that. We just were talking about standing in line getting food. But it was it was really nice to to have a guy just kind of say he's saying hi without even opening his mouth. So I thought that was a good move. That's such a nice lead in because I freaking I even though it's my business to be in business, I I don't like that lead in of like because I've had bad experiences. I'll tell you, the first year my husband was working at Blizzard. I was still working at Sony Online, and uh, World of Warcraft uh, came out soon after, so I was at my first rap party for Blizzard, and I'm there, and my husband introduced me, I think, to a guy from Cinematics, and he's like, oh, hey, this is my wife, she works at Sony Online, and he was like, huh, and he didn't <laughs> shake my hand, and he walked off, and I was like, are you kidding me? Wow. wow. Um, and that, that certainly happens at things like GC, especially when people are drinking, and they're a little out of their minds, and they feel a little more full of themselves, and again... Someone hasn't suffered their first layoff, or they don't understand that all financial cycles in games are, are finite. All trends, every, every source of income, every game model, everything has a time and an era, and eventually will come to an end. So it behooves you and everyone to be gracious um, and kind, because um, there's this great Danny Kay, old-timey actor um, quote that I love, all the people that you meet on the way up are the same people you're going to see on the way down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, be, sometimes being a jerk is more memorable than, than just being nice. So for people at GDC, try to avoid that whole, don't lead in with like, hey, who do you work for? 
Hey, what do you do? Because it's it's disgusting. I mean, I'm, that's that's such a big point for me because I will write people off permanently for that kind of stuff. Like if you if you come with me networking and you're like, um, I I will write emails all day. I I have a tab on my on my website called How to Be a Voice Actor because I get so many questions and I'm happy to to talk to people and have those dialogues because it's coming from an honest place and it's not like I can do something for them. I can't cast them or anything. But when I get emails or contacts, people are like, Oh, so what kind of projects have you worked on? Oh, that's cool. You're in games. What kind of casting people know? Bugger off! Yeah. So on your TDC, say, hey, nice to meet you. I'm Frida. I'm Jack. I'm Kyle. And then go from there. And then get into who you work for and what you do. Because that yeah. stuff doesn't matter. And it's also temporary. You can lose that job tomorrow. Video games. <laughs> and it will happen naturally. Yeah. Well, with that, guys, so uh, we're, got, we're at our hour. Wow. I hate that we can't cover everything in an hour, unfortunately. And I still have questions for Frida. So Frida, will you, can will you come back? I would be happy and honored too. This was super fun. Thank you for having me. Oh man, I'm so stoked. So now I like to kick off and with the guest first. Do you have anything that you want to promote? Oh, oh boy, yes. And I and of course I can't say anything. I'm recording for a video game this week. <laughs> nice. It's out. Um, it's 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 supposed to come out by the end of the year. So when it does come out, I will I will tag you all and be like that thing I mentioned. <laughs> Stupid NDA. Sorry. Yeah, that's that's the scene. <laughs> I'm working, and awesome. I, it might it might make a shift. I have been um I've already been in my first canceled video game as a voice actor. I'm very sorry to say. Did you pay? It was it was Command and Conquer Generals, and not only oh. did EA cancel the game, they shut down the studio that was making it. Oh, <laughs> so um, I think that was after the paychecks came in. That's uh, yeah. a, I love Command and Conquer. That's a good game. Yeah, they um the beta testers didn't like the direction the game was going, and they were really vocal about it. And EA said, you know, that's enough. We're done here. And a uh, victory, victory games, you're done. And it was a shame because I had a super huge blast. Uh, I wish I could talk more about it, but that was that was a really fun day, and it's gone forever. But hey, I've been. I've been on games that were canceled, and I've been on games that, that I was laid off from, and now I've been in a canceled game as a voice actor. It never stops. <laughs> so there's that. So okay. Jack, what do you got? Um, uh, well, at GDC, uh, I will be with the Funktronic Labs team showing off uh, Nova 111. I almost called it its code name. I'll be showing off Nova 111 uh, when they're showing that off. They're not going to be on the floor, but they'll be at like some parties and stuff. So if you're at some cool indie game parties, you'll probably see me in a yellow shirt talking about my game. Um, that's Nova111.com. If anyone didn't see last episode, and it has absolutely nothing to do to, with me, but uh, if you're working on a project that has a budget of less than a hundred thousand dollars, you can get F Mod Studio for free now. So please go and do that uh, cool. because that's super that. cool. Absolutely. Vince, what do you got going on? Oh, man, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see. Oh, tell us, tell us uh, the secrets. Yeah, well, I mean, not really secret, but if you're, if you're interested in Skullgirls Beta, that character that I've finally been, that I've been working on, Big Man, he's pretty much done. Just, uh, just play it. It's, it's a cool game if you haven't played it, and if you are on the Skullgirls Beta but you haven't seen it in a while, you'll be surprised to see that Big Man has you know, fully colored animation and full voice and all that stuff. So, yeah. Congratulations. congratulations. Yeah, congrats. congrats. Yeah. And Mike, ending it with you, going out with the, uh, the most handsome man in the world. Uh, I will uh, also be at GDC representing myself, showing off nothing. Uh, I'll be one of those uh, quiet introverted people that Vince was talking about. So uh, maybe I will shuffle past some of you. Awesome. Get you a, a high tag. Yes, wear yeah. the high tag. Yeah. Or or uh, pull pull a fat man and get a nudie suit and just a uh, big old cowboy hat. That's what you steel. need to do. Yeah, steel chairs that gets attention. Do all those things. Or the uh, Tommy Tallarico approach of hiring some models to walk alongside me the whole time. <laughs> no, he didn't. You'll get on Twitter for all the wrong reasons. Oh. <laughs> well, I am still going to. Uh, Try to do the um, the exercising, the orange juicing, get my immune system up so that I get permission to go. And if that happens, I will be showing up at the last minute. I promise. But uh, as right now, I'm I'm out. But uh, okay. So enough about that. 
We've promoted stuff. We talked to Frida, which was awesome. Thank you, Thank you so me. much for, for joining us for this. And uh, with that, I'll sign off. Thanks, guys. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Later.